There are people in Washington, D.C. that are in elective office and have been there for decades who have mastered the art of enriching themselves because corruption goes to the heart of our representative government. Politics is the way to go because if you get into politics through corruption, you can create some wealth for yourself. They will hold fundraisers for me. They will write campaign checks to me. They might even hire my son or my nephew as a lobbyist for them. So it's not uncommon to make five to 10 million a year as a uh, lobbyist. Absolutely right. Look at the people who have been in Congress for 20 or 30 years. And the founders didn't really intend this. How is corruption getting worse today? And Nancy Pelosi has done this where she and her husband got access to IPO shares of stock. And these were companies that had legislation sitting before her in Congress. I saw her net worth the other day, $140 million. I don't know how she's worth $140 million. They get to write their own rules. And this happens all the time. Trump is probably not an ally to the country club congressmen and Senate. Would you agree with that? Donald Trump came in and he disrupted that model. That's breaking all the rules. If you were to break down the most corrupt families that we've seen in politics, who would you put on that list? Probably at the top of the list would be the Biden family. My guest today is the author of Profiles in Corruption, which has 4,236 reviews on Amazon. He's also the author of Secret Empires, Clinton Cash, that nearly cost, I mean, it pretty much cost Hillary Clinton the election in 2016 when he came out with that in 2015. He's also got a couple of documentaries that came out, a recent one, Riding the Dragon, which is a story of Biden's and Hunter Biden. He's a former William J. Casey Research Fellow at Stanford University Hoover Institution, similar to Milton Friedman, as well as Thomas Sowell and many other greats. So with that being said, Peter, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Great to be here. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks. So, so Peter, last time you wrote Clinton Cash, some people said that kind of influenced and hurt the election. This time around, you wrote, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Profiles in Corruption, which was the one that came out this year, January of 2020. And when we look at the numbers, Biden won 76.3 versus Trump 71.6. Uh, how come your book and videos couldn't have more influence to turn this thing around? And how come it wasn't as effective as Clinton Cash? I'm just curious, and obviously, your thoughts on the numbers of 76.3 versus Trump 71.6. Yeah, boy, I talk, talk about a little bit of pressure there, huh? <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, look, I think that uh, the people are concerned about corruption. Um, it's not their only concern, but it's a major concern. Um, what I'm most hearted by is the fact that uh, people are concerned about these issues because corruption goes to the heart uh, of our representative government. Um, a, a corrupt official is not somebody who's representing their constituents. It's somebody that's representing their corrupt interests or rep representing themselves. So I'm just very glad that, that the uh, books do get the attention. I'm glad that uh, uh, at least uh, uh, some people in the American public learn about Hunter Biden and the, and the connections that the Biden family has to the Chinese government. I certainly wish it had been more uh, because I feel like a lot of people in the mainstream media didn't want to go there. Uh, but what's exciting these days, of course, is that there's all new sources of information like this program. Uh, things online. So it's very hard for them to squelch a story like they might have been able to do five or 10 years ago. So I have a lot of different topics I want to cover with you. You know, you're, you're somebody that's every time you write a book, people line up to buy your books. People want to know what you have to say. New York Times bestseller over and over again. Uh, they're curious to know how you process is, issues, your research, all of that combined together. So, Peter, you know, I, I was born and raised in Iran. So to, to a family whose mother's side, communist, dad side, imperialist, and there was this joke. My mom's family was, was from Russia, Armenians, Assyrians. There's this joke about if you want to be rich in countries like that, politics is the way to go. Because if you get into politics through corruption, you can create some wealth for yourself. How much of that applies to America? I think it increasingly applies to the United States. Uh, there's no question about it. I mean, there have been similar jokes in the United States uh, uh, through our history uh, in New Jersey, there's an old saying, you know, pass a bill, uh, create a living. Uh, you know, in other words, you, you pass some law, you can create it and juice it in such a way that you can self enrich. That's an inherent problem with government. But I think what's happened in the United States is 
you have a couple of phenomenon that are happening at the same time. On the one hand, uh, you have a series of places around the country where you basically have one party rule. California would be an obvious example. Whenever you have, in a sense, one party rule where there's not really a lot of competition between the parties, that invites inbred corruption. But the second problem is more foundational and fundamental. And that is that government is increasingly involved in so many parts of our lives. It creates more income opportunities. Uh, and that's, I think, a mistake that people make is they got to understand that, that part of the challenge we face uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. with the size and scope of government is ideological. There are people who actually defy the rules of history, uh, defy, the, defy the examples of history, uh, and believe that socialism and governments actually work. So they're actually true believers in socialism. But along with that, you have a lot of people in Washington, D.C. who are not necessarily committed ideologically, but they know that as government grows and expands, it creates business opportunities for them. So if you look over the span of uh, American history of the last 70 to 80 years, the fact that the government's become increasingly involved in healthcare, uh, in energy, uh, in transportation, in technology, in all of those areas, that creates a business model opportunity for people in Washington, D.C. and politicians to self-enrich. Uh, it allows them to extort money. It allows them to uh, create uh, gateways or barriers to companies that essentially they have to pay politicians to get removed. Um, so it is a problem that has existed in our history, but it's getting worse. It's getting worse because of the lack of this competition in certain areas like California, New York. But at the same time, because the government has expanded its areas of responsibility, it creates a, let's say, target-rich environment for corruption. You're saying it's getting worse. Wouldn't it be worse 100 years ago with no phone, social media? It's tougher to break the law and kind of make money on the side. You're saying it's getting worse today with more tools of being able to hold people accountable where people are texting, you're documenting more. Maybe 100 years ago, you couldn't document. How is corruption getting worse today? I think it's getting worse because of the level of opportunity. I mean, if you were a congressman in 1900, let's say, um, the scope of what the federal government did was actually fairly limited. Um, you know, this is before you had a Department of Transportation, a Department of Energy, a Department of Education. Uh, this was before you had a um, regulatory regime uh, that applied to so many industries. Um, and the thing people have to understand is that government power creates a opportunity uh, for the benefit of the political class. Uh, there's actually a school of economics called public choice theory. Public choice theory really says you have to look at government officials and bureaucrats uh, the same way you look at a businessman. A businessman is trying to build his business uh, for his benefit, for the benefit of profit. That's actually good. Uh, that's what fuels our economy. Uh, just because somebody puts on a government uh, hat does not mean that they're not self-interested, they're not interested in their own uh, uh, self-good and their self-profit. Um, so we have to understand that's the model. So yes, you are correct. There's more transparency today in the sense that we have the internet, we have the Freedom of Information Act, we have these tools, but the problem is the field of battle uh, for self-enrichment is so much larger a congressman today has so many more industries that he can effectively shake down uh, than a congressman in 19, uh, 1900 ever even could have dreamed of. Hey, can you unpack what shakedown means to you? Yeah, shakedown basically means extortion. People are used to thinking of extortion in the context of, uh, you know, what the mafia does. They, you know, they visit a local uh uh, a butcher shop in Buffalo, New York, and, and they basically say, look, if you want to pay protection money, it'd be terrible if something happened to this shop, pay protection money and we'll make sure that nothing happens. Well, that's extortion. We all recognize that's illegal. We've seen that in movies. Some people have experienced that. Uh, government oftentimes can function the same way. Uh, there are many members of Congress that, that use tools and techniques that aren't widely discussed. I've written about them. Members of Congress have talked to me about them. Uh, they have something called a milker bill, uh, a milker bill. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the dairy industry. Uh, it's designed to milk money from certain industries. So how does a milker bill work? Well, if I'm the chairman of a powerful committee in Congress 
and I need to raise money, or let's say I need to find a, a uh, lobbying opportunity for my son, I'm going to introduce a bill in Congress to, let's say, put a 20% surtax on the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley. Now, I don't actually believe in this bill. I don't even necessarily want this bill to pass. But what's going to happen is that when I introduce that bill, I'm going to have a flood of lobbyists from Silicon Valley come and say, Congressman Schweitzer, why are you introducing this bill? And what will happen over the next 60 days is a dance. Uh, whereby they will come and meet, they will hold fundraisers for me, they will write campaign checks to me, they might even hire my son or my nephew as a lobbyist for them. This happens all the time. My question fundamentally is, how is that any different than the shakedown of the shop owner in Buffalo, New York? It's the same form of extortion. It's the same element that says, look, Something bad is going to happen to you. I'm going to take more money away unless you pay me protection money now. And that happens in Washington, D.C. all the time. And it's the kind of extortive behavior um, that's become all too familiar in Washington. I think that, that there, there's sort of a myth. A lot of people feel that, that the problem in Washington is that there's all this money flowing into Washington, that corporations and businesses around the world are just happy to send their money to Washington, D.C. They don't really want to, but they feel like they have to, because if they don't, bad things are going to happen to them. And that's exactly what the political class in Washington wants them to believe, because it's so lucrative for the political class. So business model, number one, introduce a bill that you have no interest in to scare off whoever it is in any kind of an industry, meat, technology, healthcare, whatever it may be. Then yeah. wait for the lobbyists of those companies to reach out to you to say, hey, you know, we don't think this is a good bill. Can we change your mind, et cetera, et cetera. Then what happens? Because is it a way of me paying your campaign or is it, is it side money? W what happens next? Because that's the question. It, it's a great question. Oftentimes it's campaign money. Um, uh, actually, in my book, Extortion, uh, there's an example from, uh, from uh, Congressman, uh, uh, sorry, from uh, uh, a gentleman named Mr. Hoffmeister, who's the CEO of, of Shell Oil. And he described a meeting that he had in 2009. You remember in 2009, oil prices were pretty high. He sat before a congressional committee. Members of Congress, including Maxine Waters, essentially said, we want to nationalize your company. We think it's outrageous, the profits you're making. Hoffmeister reported to me, and I put in my book, that after that meeting, Congressman Waters talked to him and said, I might understand your issue better if we spend some time together. And this was basically saying, you need to raise money for me, and I will take the threat for nationalizing your business away. So what you're doing is you're having a series of coded conversations, but you know exactly what's going on. A shakedown is taking place, and the beauty or the genius of a milker bill is you don't actually want it to pass. If I introduce a bill for a 20% tax on Silicon Valley, and that bill passes, Guess what? I can't introduce that bill again and shake down Silicon Valley. I actually want the bill to fail. Um, one of the reasons that you see a lot of tax credits uh, that are passed, for example, in 1981, Congress passed a bill for an R&D tax credit for companies to invest in research and development. People wonder in, in the business community, why has that tax credit never been made permanent? Well, the reason they ask that question is they're not thinking uh, about this as a shakedown. If they make the tax credit permanent, a congressman can't go back to them and ask them for money when they have to extend it. So they have these things called tax extenders. We're going to extend a tax credit for two to three years. Uh, and then what's going to happen is they're going to have to come. They're going to meet with me. They're going to raise more money with me. And then I'm going to vote to extend it for another couple of years. But I'm never going to make it permanent because if I make it permanent, I lose my leverage and my ability to extract money from it. Uh, that's powerful, by the way, what you just said right there. So it's an increment. So let me leave it to renew it. You need to spend money or else I'm not going to renew it. So you got to help me out. And it's constant. It's not ne it's never ending. So here, here's the difference. You know, I've interviewed a lot of the mobsters out there, whether it's Sammy Double, Gravano, Colada, Franzese. A lot of them have sat down with them. And the attorneys, Oscar Goodman, who's the legendary attorney for Spalatra and a lot of the mobsters. The difference between what happens to politicians and mobsters is 
Every one of them did time, okay? Or their time. <laughs> yeah. The part where voters, both on the left, right, and the middle, are losing trust in the system is because when's the last time a big politician did time? And so the audience kind of sits around and says, I guess they didn't do any kind, anything corrupt because I don't see them doing any kind of time. So when is the last time we had the highest level of politician that did time for doing extortion or corruption or anything that you're talking about? It's been a very long time. And, and uh, you know, part of the problem is that they get to write their own rules. Now, you know, corporate executives don't get to write their own laws. Uh, school teachers don't get to write their own laws. I don't get to write my own laws. You don't. But members of Congress do. Uh, and so they know where those lines are, and they are able to engage in behaviors that if the rest of us were to do, they would be considered extortive practices. So, for example, um, if a corporate executive tried to leverage their position for their own personal benefit, in other words, they were the head of, let's say, General Electric, uh, and as part of their official duty as CEO, they tried to leverage taking an action or not taking an action so they could derive a personal benefit, uh, they would at a minimum be in trouble with the SEC and probably be in trouble uh, with federal prosecutors as well, because that's against the law. That happens in Congress all the time. Why? Because Congress has written the rules in such a way to where they do not apply to their behavior. Uh, one of my earliest books uh, that I wrote about corruption involved insider trading on the stock market by members of Congress. Um, and a lot of people were out, outraged to learn this, that if a corporate executive trades their own company's stock with what's called material non-public information, in other words, they know something that nobody else knows as a function of working for that company, so they trade on it and profit, they're going to go to jail. And lots of people have done that from secretaries to corporate CEOs. That law does not apply to members of Congress. So if you're the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, for example, uh, and you are, you know for a fact that a certain defense bill that's highly contested is going to pass, and it's going to mean huge sums of money for Boeing or huge sums of money for another defense contractor, you are, as a senator, allowed to buy and sell stock in that company. Uh, I would argue that's non-public material information that's going to affect the stock price, uh, and yet for years, members of Congress were exempt from that law. It was only when we called it out, I, I did a, a book that became a bestseller. We did a, a segment on 60 Minutes uh, that, that caused a big uproar. Did they pass a bill called the Stock Act to technically declare that it's illegal for members of Congress to engage in insider trading on the stock market? The problem is they later went back and watered down that bill, so that bill really does not have much meaning anymore. But my point is, to, to answer your question, is the reason very few powerful political figures go to prison is because they get to write their own rules, and they know where the lines are, and the lines are very different for them. They're much more narrow for us than they are for them. That's why you don't see a lot of people going to jail in positions of power. How does that make sense, though? So if that's the case, and if I'm a voter, whatever side I'm at, you know, each side thinks the other side is corrupt. Liberals think Republicans are corrupt. Conservatives think the Democrats are corrupt. Both sides are, are talking about the other side is corrupt, but no one's seeing anyone getting trouble. Why should I trust anything anyone's talking about? And, you know, why should I sit there and say, well, I trust in the law to know that that person is doing wrong? So and then what is the price? and potential future consequences if the voters don't believe in you getting in trouble for doing corrupt behavior. So then I don't trust in the politicians. And how do we address that? I mean, that's a big concern because you're hearing it on both sides. Everybody's talking about how the other side is corrupt. Who do you believe and what methods should be taken for these guys to be held accountable? Uh, well, I think it's a great question. I think what we're seeing in the country today, the political tumult on the left, right, and center is precisely to your point. Uh, the fact that there is distrust. I don't think there's distrust in the system as much as there's a distrust in the leadership and how they have manipulated the system. I think a lot of people recognize that, that you know, the founding uh, fathers gave us this, this, this powerful system that diffused power, uh, that made sure that power would not be concentrated. They like that system. The problem is that, that there is, in a sense, 
a consensus in Washington, D.C. A lot of people don't realize that. There's a consensus in Washington, D.C. on these corruption issues. What do I mean? Uh, what I'm saying is that bipartisanship is not dead in Washington. Most people on the, on the right and on the left that are in positions of authority in Washington, D.C. generally agree to the rat ground rules of, of how what I call legal graft occurs in Washington. They accept the fact that members of Congress have family members that are lobbyists, even if they're not qualified, and that those family members get paid uh, because of the position of authority that their mother or father might have as a member of Congress. Um, they all know it's corrupt, but the ground rules are such that they all are benefiting. So there's a consensus that's emerged. They don't talk about it. So what you have is you have, of course, red states and blue states in America. What you also have is really the rest of America against the Washington Beltway. Um, and that I think is underappreciated. And I think one of the reasons that you see a right left divide is because there are leaders in Washington who don't want there to be a consensus on this issue. Uh, I find lots of times, whether I go on Fox News or whether I go on Wisconsin Public Radio, which is left of center, by and large, they grouse and they're concerned about the same thing, about corrupt leadership. They might be pointing the, the finger in a different direction, but they're talking about corrupt leadership. And what we need to have is a consensus. Uh, number one, term limits. I know it's been discussed many times, but if you look at the corrupt behavior that involves elected officials in Washington, D.C., it's almost to a person. The longer they stay in power, the more they become seduced by power, the more prone they are to engage in corrupt behavior. So if you've been in Congress for 30 years, the odds are infinitesimally higher that you're going to engage in corrupt or extorted behavior than if you've been there for three years. Term limits would be a great way uh, to start. Second of all, a ban on lobbying by members of Congress and their immediate family members. Uh, this is a, a position that has been supported by everyone from AOC on the left to Ted Cruz on the right. There's another consensus point that I think would be enormously helpful because you would get away from this self-enrichment model where elected politicians feel that they are entitled they're doing great service to the country. They're irreplaceable, but they're not paid enough. They're not appreciated enough. So it's okay to engage in this sort of legal graft where their son or daughter suddenly becomes a highly paid lobbyist, even though they have absolutely no expertise. There are areas of consensus. The problem is the left-right divide pre prevents us, I think, from going forward and addressing some of these issues. That's, that's powerful. The term limits and the ban on lobbying members of Congress, as well as family, both AOC and Ted Cruz agree on that. So who doesn't want those two to pass, both term limits and ban on lobbying? Who are the people both on the left and the right say, no, 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 we're not good. We're not, we don't want to pass that. Well, I think a lot of them. I think if, if, you, if, you, if you had an open uh, 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 discussion um, uh, where they were candid, most elected officials would be opposed to those pieces of legislation. The problem that they have is that both of those are supported by 89% of their constituents. So the point is, they don't want to have a debate and a discussion about it. When the issue of insider trading uh, by members of Congress came up, a bill on that matter had been introduced years before, uh, and they had had maybe 15 sponsors. Once it became public, once it reached critical mass, once the American public left, right, and center became outraged and it became an issue, you suddenly went from having 15 sponsors to more than 300 in the House of Representatives. Why did they do that? They did it because they felt they needed to do it or they were going to offend enough constituents whereby they wouldn't be reelected. So the issue here on term limits and the ban on, on uh, uh, lobbying the real critical issue is there for, for there to be a consensus enough to where elected officials fear uh, that issue and feel like they have to vote for it or they're going to lose their jobs. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get most members of Congress to do something that's going to end up affecting their ability to enrich themselves and their family. Peter, can you give some names of who's against it and who's for it? You just gave two names, AOC and Ted Cruz, that would be for banning lobbying. Uh, but who's against, you know, let's keep term limits the way it is. Let's keep lobbying the way it is. Can you give us an idea which camp is which camp? 
Well, I would look at the uh, I would look at the leadership of the House of Representatives, whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Steny Hoyer. Um, uh, both of them have been in Congress for decades, uh, have never been in favor of term limits. Um, uh, their view, which I think is wrong, is that somebody who's been in Congress has a certain uh, amount of expertise uh, that's needed. Um, I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think there are many qualified people that can come in and take their positions. I think if you look at the U.S. Senate, you have the same thing. I mean, there's a reason uh, Senator Mitch McConnell has not brought a term limits to, uh, to the floor uh, and has not want to have it discussed. So again, look at the people who have been in Congress for 20 or 30 years. Uh, they become accustomed to it. And, and the founders didn't really intend this. Uh, initially, to be in the Senate and to be in the House of Representatives, the first hundred years of American history was kind of seen as a burden. It was kind of seen as something you did as an obligation to your community, your state, and to your country. Uh, you're somebody who had success in farming or as a printer or as a, you know, raising horses, whatever it was. You ran for office, you served for one or two terms, and you went back to what you did before. Uh, really beginning in the 20th century, this idea of a career politician where you could do good and do well, where you could enrich yourself by Congress, that is a relatively new phenomenon in the United States and a very, very dangerous one. So uh, I would look at, you know, probably 75% of both political parties in Washington, D.C. in elected office would not want those bills to pass. But I would also say that the vast majority of them would vote for it if they believed that their constituents were fed up and wanted those pieces of legislation to pass. So, so if that's the case, if what you're saying is 75% of them would hate to have term limits and ban on lobbying, if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense that many current Republicans, whether they're in the Senate or the House, probably are not fans of a guy like Trump because Trump could cost them their job and their ability to lobby because that's how they've been able to get uh, constantly reelected over the years. So a Trump is probably not an ally to the country club type of people of, you know, uh, congressmen and Senate. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, uh, you know, Donald Trump is, uh, to use the term that, that they use in, in Silicon Valley and in the tech space, Donald Trump is a disruptor. Uh, he has fundamentally changed in a lot of respects, not in all, but in a lot of respects, the business model of Washington, D.C., of how things are done. How are things done in Washington, D.C.? You serve in the cabinet, you serve in Congress, you leave, you become a lobbyist, or you go into government relations, which is really just another form of lobbying. Or you end up going to work for a government contractor that you as a member of Congress earmarked legislation to get them extra money. That's the way business has been done in Washington, D.C. for a long time. Uh, and like Trump or not, like the tweets or not, Donald Trump came in and he disrupted that model. He started talking about it. He started airing it. He pushed for reforms. Uh, here was a guy who himself did not come up through the political system. Uh, in fact, he complained, uh, and rightfully so, about having to write checks for politicians because he was a real estate developer and he needed to make sure he had access to people who might be disruptive to what he was trying to do. Um, that's breaking all the rules. <laughs> You're not supposed to talk about these things publicly. You're not supposed to call people out on them. Uh, You're supposed to allow the system to function the way that it has for decades on a bipartisan basis. Whether Clinton or Bush or Obama has been in office, that's basically the way that business has been done. Trump came in and, and aggressively worked to change that. He had success in some areas, in other you know, other areas less so because, again, he needed the cooperation of Congress and that never happened. So Trump has been a disruptive force. Those that like his policies or not, those that like his, his personality or not, cannot ignore or I think diminish the fact that he has undermined this business model in Washington, D.C. And that, in my mind, is unequivocally a good thing. I've spoken to many of my friends who were former lobbyists, and they shared with me the kind of money that's potentially there to make. But maybe for the viewer that hasn't had the ability to talk to somebody to know what kind of mon money lobbyists make, what is the business model for the lobbyist? Not, not the you know, politician, but the actual lobbyist representing a company. What is their business model? 
Um, well, their business model is to take their position, uh, and their position may have been as a congressional staffer, it may have been for a member of Congress, and then when they leave office, whether they retire from Congress or they leave as a congressional staffer or they're voted out of office as a member of Congress, uh, it's to become a lobbyist and to go to the very people uh, that you perform services for while you were in office and to now get paid. Um, so, you know, think about it that, uh, think about it this way. Sometimes there are transactions where if I'm purchasing something from you, you give me a good and I pay you back directly. Sometimes if we're exchanging a service, you perform a service and we sign a retainer agreement. I don't pay you the full amount, but I pay you a certain amount every month just to make sure that we have that retainer agreement. Lobbying is very similar. Oftentimes they use the retainer model. So if I'm the powerful, you know, powerful chairman of a congressional committee, I decide to retire me, I become a lobbyist. Let's say I was chairman of the House Budget Committee. Enormous power and influence on federal government spending. I'm going to set up a lobbyist shop, and what's going to happen is all the government contractors, all the individuals who are getting government money, are now going to hire me uh, as a lobbyist, uh, and I can make $50,000 a month just from one client, and I might have 15 or 20 clients at the same time. Basically, what I'm going to use is my position as the former chairman of the committee to do what? I'm going to go to the current occupants, and I'm going to say, look, I need you to do me a favor. I have this client that needs this written into, into legislation, or they need this, this favor done. And the current occupant, based on the way it works in Washington, D.C., is going to play ball. Why are they going to play ball? Because when they leave as chairman of the House Budget Committee, they're probably going to do the same thing. So it's a business model and a system that is on rotation. Um, and it's very, you know, infrequently talked about. Uh, it's very infrequently discussed. Why? Because both sides do it. Um, it's, it's one of the few things in Washington that's still bipartisan, but this ability to make money uh, as a member of Congress when you really don't necessarily even have any other skill set other than the fact that you know other people in positions of power is an enormously alluring way to make money, and nobody wants to disrupt that. So it's not uncommon to make five to 10 million a year as a uh, lobbyist, if you're a good lobbyist. Oh yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and also, you know, to be clear, there's a lot that you can do in the area of, let's say, government relations um, that's not technically lobbying, but, but it's essentially the same thing with a few slight modifications. So you take a guy uh, like Senator Tom Daschle, uh, former uh, a leader for Democrats in the US Senate, he's been out for, uh, uh, for a while, uh, but Tom Dasher will say, I'm not a lobbyist, I'm in government relations. But what does he do? He represents pharmaceutical companies and others that have a beef or that have a problem or want a favor from the federal government. And as long as he doesn't cross that threshold into being a lobbyist, whereby he devotes a certain amount of his time to asking for specific legislation to pass, he can avoid being labeled a lobbyist. But he's still pulling in $50,000 a month from a client doing favors and getting benefits from Washington, D.C. I mean, that's real money, making five to 10 million a year. You got you got pretty good uh, lifestyle. Now, why do some of these guys like if Nancy wanted to leave and say, I don't want to do what I'm doing anymore. I'm going to go out there and be a lobbyist and open up my own place and make a bunch of money. Why? Why is she staying in? Why is Schumer staying in? Because the money isn't that good. I mean, I saw her net worth the other day, $140 million. I don't know how she's worth $140 million. And I saw that 60 minute, by the way. But why aren't some of them leaving to make more money as a lobbyist? That's a good question. I mean, some people, I guess, have you know different uh, different motivations. But I think to be more to the point, there are people in Washington D.C. that are in elective office and have been there for decades who have mastered the art of enriching themselves. What I would call again legal graft, but they use their position as a member of Congress to self enrich themselves. And let me just give you a couple of, of examples. One would be uh, issues relating to stock market manipulation and favor. And this would be an example with Nancy Pelosi. So let's say you are a, a senator from the great state of Texas, and I want a favor. If I walk in and I give you a shoebox with $100,000 in cash, um, we're going to be in trouble because that's illegal. I can't pay you a bribe. You can't accept a bribe in, terms, in exchange for a favor. 
But consider this, and this is something Nancy Pelosi has done for decades, but consider this. I need a favor from you, Senator. Um, and oh, by the way, I'm connected with this company that's going to be going public. Um, and, and I can get you access to the friends and family round of IPO stock, whereby you can buy stock for pennies on the dollar. And when this stock goes public, you're going to make $100,000 in a single day. Now, if that's our conversation, that's actually not illegal. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi has done this. I mean, we found uh, in our investigation with 60 Minutes uh, at, at, at least uh, eight instances where she and her husband got access to IPO shares of stock before companies went public. And these were companies that had legislation sitting before her in Congress. Uh, the most extreme example was Visa, the credit card company that went public in 2008. Um, she and her husband uh, got 5,000 uh, uh, pre-IPO shares of stock in that company. I, uh, Visa had legislation they wanted killed. She killed that legislation. When Visa went public, Pelosi and her husband made $100,000 in a single day. Um, so that's one example of how this works. So there, you, you don't have to leave office necessarily to cash in. If you're smart and clever and willing to frankly be corrupt, there are things that you can do in office. Let me give you another example of how it works, and that would be what I would call the land deal. Uh, and here I can cite examples of Harry Reid, the former senator from Nevada. I can also talk about Dennis Hastert, the former Republican Speaker of the House. In Dennis Hastert's case, um, his net worth when he became Speaker of the House was minimal. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars. By the time he left, only eight years later, he was worth millions of dollars. Now, how does that happen? He's a, he's a former wrestling coach, went into Congress. How did that happen? Well, he used what I call the land deal. So he's the Speaker of the House. He buys himself individually as a private citizen as he can a, a, a parcel of land in the middle of nowhere in Illinois where he's from. I mean, this is rural Illinois in the middle of nowhere. Gets the land very cheap. Within 18 months, he is the Speaker of the House, uh, introduces the highway transportation bill for federal subsidies to transportation. In that bill includes legislation for something called the Prairie Parkway, which is going to run where? Through Illinois, which is going to run where? Right by the property that he had purchased a year and a half earlier. Um, the valuation of that land went up dramatically. He made literally half a million dollars just in that one deal. And here's the scary part. What he did was exposed. It's not illegal. It's not illegal to do what he did. So there are many things that elected officials in office can do right now to self-enrich themselves. That's why Nancy Pelosi is now worth more than $100 million, uh, having been in Congress for the last 30 years. Her husband's a businessman, but a lot of his business deals dovetail very nicely with the legislation that she's working on in Washington. How, mu how much of politics is it about, you know, the industry of politics attracts corrupt people or the industry of politics corrupts people? Uh, I think it's both. <laughs> and I don't say that a cop out, but I think it's both. I mean, I think there are people that, that, uh, come in there idealistically uh, and, and get seduced. Um, one of the people that I've gotten to know over the years is uh, the former uh, governor of Louisiana, former congressman, Bobby Jindal. Um, and Bobby Jindal uh, told me one time when he had served in Congress, I believe he served three terms. Um, he said, when I first got there, you know, they talked about fundraising and all these things we were going to do. And he just said, he said, it just seemed so dirty. It just seems so dirty. You know, you're supposed to pick a committee uh, that, that's going to allow you to raise a lot of money. You're not going to raise a lot of money sitting on the Veterans Committee. You want to be the Financial Services Committee because you can really shake down those Wall Street guys. He said, when you first get there, you hear that. It just feels so dirty and awful. He said, but after the, you're there a couple of years, you're like, yeah, that's how things are done. Uh, he said, it, it's, it's when, like when you first get there, it's successful. But after a couple of years, that cesspool becomes a hot tub. So there's no question there are people that go there with good intentions. They get caught up with the power. They get seduced by the power. And they are corrupted. But 
let's also be clear. There are people that go in there and their intention, I think pretty early on, they see the extractive power of being a member of Congress. Let's be honest. They don't really have life skills that are going to lend themselves to rising in the corporate world or in the medical field or in the law profession. They're not capable of running their own businesses, but they are capable of shaking down a people and, and abusing their power. So politics attracts those people as well, regardless whether they come in with good intentions or they come in with corruption. My point would be term limits stops both of them. Top, stops people in both of those categories from staying for a long period of time and exploding their position. Interesting. That's a, that's a good perspective on both ends that uh, how it takes place. So uh, you've written books, Clinton Cash, Secret Empires, Profiles and Corruption, and you've been studying this topic for quite some time. You started writing about it. I think you wrote a book about Reagan back in 03, I think, uh, I think it was yeah. 03, when you were, and you've written prior to that as, as well. Um, if you were to break down the most corrupt families that we've seen in politics, both sides over the last, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years, who would you put on that list? Great question. Um, I would say uh, that um, probably at the top of the list in terms of breadth and scope uh, would be the Biden family. Um, and I don't say that. Well, Clinton. Yes, I would say, I would say the Biden family. Um, and the reason I would say that is the size and the scope. In the case of Bill and Hillary Clinton, um, they ran a very successful uh, a corruption racket. Um, you know, whether it's legal or not is obviously open to debate, uh, but it essentially involved the two of them and they were tag teams. So Bill Clinton is president of the United States, his wife is first lady, he leaves, she becomes a senator, he's a private citizen, but it essentially becomes, if you want to benefit, uh, if you want some benefit from Senator Hillary Clinton, pay Bill Clinton and benefits will flow your way. When she becomes Secretary of State, you pay Bill Clinton inflated speaking fees, you give him other, other benefits, um, and at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, the Clintons enrich themselves. The Clinton Foundation was corrupt, the speaking fees were corrupt, no question about it. But what you have with the Bidens is really unique um, in, in terms of the scope and the breadth. What do I mean? In terms of breadth, um, people know about Hunter Biden. A lot of people do. They've heard about Hunter Biden. They may have even heard of James Biden. Uh, but as I point out in my book, there are actually five members of the Biden family. I call them the Biden Five, uh, who I argue engaged in corrupt behavior. Some of it legal, some of it probably questionable. But the point is five members of the family have enriched themselves. Um, and they've been very blatant about it. Um, if you look at Hunter Biden's career, um, even when his father was a senator, uh, he was a lobbyist working for Delaware entities looking for federal grants. Well, where would De Delaware entities go to look for federal grants? They would go to Hunter Biden's father. They hire Hunter Biden to do that job. He's a lobbyist in other respects. Um, when, it, and when it becomes clear that you have to disclose uh, the fact that you're introducing earmarked legislation for the benefit of a family member who's a lobbyist, Hunter Biden is forced to switch positions and do something else. Uh, when his father becomes vice president of the United States, he, be called, he becomes involved in corruption on a global scale. And this is where I talk about the breadth and the depth. And what I mean here is the depth of corruption. The corruption involving the Biden family, it's not akin to a, you know, a nephew of a congressman who's trying to get a road paving contract. Um, uh, you know, so he can make an extra buck. The corruption we're talking about with the Bidens involves foreign governments. It involves foreign governments, specifically the Chinese government, which is our chief rival on the global stage. It involves corrupt oligarchs in Ukraine. So that is hard to beat as, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I would put the Bidens at the top of the list. I would probably put the, uh, the, uh, the, the Clintons uh, second. Um, there is, uh, was a, a Republican senator um, who has had three members of his family who has been lobbyists. Um, I would put them near the top of the list. The name is escaping me right now. He's still in office, uh, a senator from, uh, from Missouri. Um, I don't know why the name is escaping me. I, I would put him on the list. I wrote about him in my book on, uh, on extortion. Um, he would be number three on the list. 
Um, and then I would probably put um, Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chow on that list as well uh, for their ties to uh, the, the government of China. Uh, in their case, it's not quite as bad, I think, as the Bidens, uh, because in her case, her family actually did have a shipping company uh, before she married Mitch McConnell, before he uh, arose in power as a U.S. senator. Uh, but there's no question that they have benefited from the largesse of the Chinese government, and that is as a result of the fact that he has softened his position on China over the years, as Elaine Chao has as well. You see, you know, when you're saying that to me, um, we saw a lot of stuff about Bill Clinton and the Clintons being uh, corrupt and all the articles came afterwards. Well, look at what happened with them in Africa and they went in, but yeah. they were doing corrupt with the leaders of Africa. And then Haiti, when the big earthquake happened, they went out there saying, we're going to build 5,000 homes at, I don't know, $59 million, ended up building 2,600 homes at $90 million. And where did that money go to? And they paid Bill Clinton 350 two times to give a speech where typically he was making 150 to 200 at the time. Okay, yeah. I saw all of that, that's fine. But to me, that's after he left being a president, after he left being a president. And then for the most part, maybe America doesn't want to humiliate a former president. Maybe it's not good for America. So we pardon and just kind of leave it alone. Even when you know Trump said, because you'd be in jail, he didn't come out when he had the House, Senate and presidency, he didn't go after Hillary. So maybe it was somebody behind closed doors whispered and said, Trump, you may want to not do Hillary because eight years from now, someone's going to come after you. Maybe just kind of slow your roll. Maybe there is that exchange. Let's not humiliate the bigger leaders. But uh, Biden was not a president. He ran with all of this stuff. And you're seeing the data. So Biden's son was paid $5 billion from a Chinese oil company, CEFC. You know, he created a $1 billion fund, BHR, from a state-owned bank of China and owned by State Bank of China. Received $3.5 million wire transfer from Elena Baturina, the wife of former mayor of Moscow, earned $4.2 million from Ukraine energy company Burisma. Okay, if all of that stuff is true, if all of that stuff is true, how the hell did Biden get 76.3 million votes if it's as corrupt as some people say it is? Because I'm not worried about the 42% of Democrats that could care less what happens as long as Trump is out, they're happy. And I don't care about the, not that I don't care, I don't, put the weight behind the 44% of Republicans that just go right all the way down. As long as it's not the left, they're happy. And put the other 4% aside of libertarians, green, whatever you want to call it. I look at the 10%. The 10% is who rules the world. The 10% is who rules the, our elections, right? The 10% is sitting there saying, Peter, you know that documentary you did that was live on the Blaze TV and you know saying that Biden did this and Biden did that and Biden did this? We bought the Clinton cash so Hillary didn't get elected. But I don't know, I'm seeing it on this channel, I'm seeing it on all these people that are talking about Biden. If it is really so true about Hunter Biden, how did Joe Biden become the president-elect? It's a great question. I mean, it's, 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 it's mystifying to me as well. I mean, I live and breathe uh, the research that we do on corruption and cronyism. So I take these issues very passionately. I think part of the problem is that um, a large portion of the American people are not that familiar with the story of Biden corruption. And the reason is that it got very little attention from the mainstream media. ABC News did a story on it uh, uh, in late 2019 that I thought was pretty good. Uh, that was mentioned in the New York Post. Uh, there are obviously several stories there. Uh, the Wall Street Journal did a story, but the major networks, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post really did not demonstrate much curiosity at all about this story. And that to me is really shocking because one of the oldest stories in journalism is follow the money. I mean, think about all the times that, that uh, we've turned on our TV and we've seen a story about, you know, uh, big oil or big tech or big labor unions that, uh, you know, uh, held fundraisers for an elected official and that elected official then sponsored legislation to benefit those entities. That's a hallmark of journalism. I used to do those stories with CNN. Um, this is that story on steroids, because you not only have money in the equation, you have a foreign government in the equation. You have corrupt foreign oligarchs in the equation. You have the fact that Hunter Biden has no skills to sell. I mean, the question I keep asking my friends, they say, oh, you know, well, Hunter Biden, he's a businessman. He has to make a living. You know, my question is, is what was he selling? 
What was he selling? He, he doesn't have a skill set. He has nothing to offer the Chinese government other than his connections to his father. That's why he's being given $5 million. Um, so I think the first part of the problem is that a lot of the media ignored this and suppressed this story. You saw what happened when the New York Post tweeted about it. Twitter shut down their Twitter account. I mean, this was blatant censorship. Uh, and these are precisely the kinds of stories that people should know about. Um, nobody has challenged the facts about this. Nobody has said that it's not true. Nobody said Hunter didn't get involved in this private equity fund or get this money from the Chinese energy company or get the million dollars a year from Burisma. They just simply have said, end of story, nothing to discuss. So the first problem has been media censorship. I think the second issue is that we are a very divided country and uh, there, there are a, a large portion of the country that believe that they should turn a blind eye to the corruption on their side in order to make sure that their side wins. And my argument, I guess, to them would be, whether you're a Republican, whether you are a Democrat, no political figure is irreplaceable. Um, what Democrats should have done, because this issue with corruption in Biden is not going away. He's a president-elect. He's probably going to be president of the United States. The issue of this corruption is not going away. This issue should have been aired in the primaries. This issue should have come out in the primaries. It should have been had aired. And if people had decided at that point, we're happy with this, then so be it. But now we have a president that's elected um, and people have decided to turn a blind eye and this never ends up well. When you have elected officials that are corrupt, uh, they end up making poor decisions. They end up being distracted. They may end up even having some legal liability. And my point is, Nobody's irreplaceable. Um, what politicians will tell you is, look aside, ignore this corruption. You need me to advance the cause, to fight the cause, to get this work done. Nobody is irreplaceable. For every Joe Biden, for up every corrupt member of Congress, you can find people that you agree with on your side that can run for office and get, that can be effective that are not corrupt at that time. And that's what I tell everybody left, right, and center. Do not turn a blind eye to corruption uh, from somebody on your side. That's what they want us to do. Uh, and that's why we were, where we have a situation with so many uh, ele elected corrupt officials. Well, the current business model doesn't incentivize to do that. Simple right. as that. The, the current yeah. business model and the voting system that we have, it doesn't incentivize me to say, oh yeah, some guy on my side is being corrupt. It, it doesn't do that. There's no incentive. We're not teaching that. The comp structure, if you want to say, isn't set up in a way for somebody to say, yeah, you know what, I disagree with what there's, you know, because if, if I recall, in the Democratic primary, when they were debating all the candidates, whoever you had on the stage, the Sanders, the Warren, you know, Pete, all of these guys were debating. I don't remember Hunter Biden coming up at all. I don't remember anything about the family coming up. So do you think behind closed doors, the DNC, Tom Perez is sitting down saying, guys, no, the one thing you can do, if you even think about bringing anything about the Biden family, that's a no-no. We're going to do this. Does it go that deep? Or am I, you know, is, is that too much of thinking to say the DNC doesn't go that deep? Uh, it, you know, it could be. I mean, look, there's no question. You're exactly right. This issue did not really come up in the primaries. Hunter, uh, sorry, Joe Biden was asked about it on the campaign trail. But Biden's primary opponents, you know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, nobody brought it up. Remember in 2016, uh, when Hillary Clinton was running and Bernie Sanders was the last man standing, he pointedly said, you know, I think this story about the emails, you know, is ridiculous. I think the Clinton Foundation stuff is ridiculous. The argument was for unity. I think unity, I understand the appeal to it. I think at that stage, it's a mistake because it prevents you from airing issues that need to be aired. And again, this is where I think you have to give Trump credit. Like Trump or not, like his policies or not, in the 2016 primary, he was very open, uh, you know, not only sort of calling out people on their policies, but calling them out on the fact that, that you know, they had deals or that they were engaged in, in, in behavior that was corrupt or they were part of the swamp. To my mind, that's a healthy process. You need that kind of a cleansing process. And people are counting on a primary to be a horse race. 
But if you have a situation where you know a number of horses in the in the race are not running as hard as as fast as they could uh, in the name of unity, it undermines the process, and you end up getting a president elect, as I think we have with Joe Biden, uh, that is going to be weakened. Hunter Biden issue is not going to go away, and you have this very real problem of the fact that the president of the United States' son may be subject to extortion uh, or, or some kind of, let's say, persuasion by a foreign power because they have knowledge about things that he's engaged in uh, that he does not want to come out. That's a very serious problem. This should have been aged in the, uh, it should have been aired in the primary, but it was not, and I think to the detriment of the country. I, I, and I don't think anything's, uh, in my opinion, I don't think anything's going to change there. Do you think it's a good thing? Let's just say, let's give an example. Okay, pick McConnell, pick the senator from Missouri you were talking about, uh, pick uh, 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 Clinton's, pick Biden. Let's just pick any of the families, whichever one it is. Do you think it's good for America if the law came down hard, public, humiliating, you know, it's it's out in the front. Everybody has to report it. You don't even have a choice to avoid it. Whether your name is Hannity, Tucker, or Don Lemon, or Cuomo, you have to report what's being said. Do you think it would be a good thing for America if one of these corrupt families was exposed publicly? Yes, absolutely. No question about it. I, I, I think that we are a, a, a country that's ruled by laws, not by men. Uh, I'm certainly not a lawyer, so I'm not going to be able to talk about the specific code, but there's no question in my mind. If laws have been broken, uh, charges need to be brought, but I would be even more sharp than that. I think it's the obligation of the media uh, to be calling out powerful elected officials, and part of the reason that they don't do it uh, is because they want access. You know, if you run a particularly harsh story on Mitch McConnell or on Joe Biden, yeah. Uh, you're not going to get access to the sort of information that you might need to run your news organization. You also have the cultural phenomenon. I mean, the reason I think particularly the Washington Post, the New York Times, some of these network uh, television programs don't want to do it is they're part of a social set in Washington, D.C. They're part of the establishment. Uh, and they don't want to call out somebody else in the establishment, whether it's a powerful senator or the president of the United States, for fear that they're going to be shunned the way you might have been shunned in middle school if you did something embarrassing. So I think social pressure is brought to bear. But, but the, the, the old uh, muckraking journalism that we're used to thinking of, where, where it's deep expose on the finances of our elected officials, of the foreign ties of our elected officials, that used to be the kinds of stories that we would expect of, say, 60 Minutes in the 1970s or 1980s, those days are gone, um, and, and we are missing a vigorous media that is holding our leaders into account. They are absent, uh, and that means that we have to have other institutions. We need to have programs like this. We need to have organizations like mine. Uh, we need alternative sources of news media to hold them into account, because if they're not held into account, it's just going to become worse and worse and worse. Let, let, let me let me ask you a question. Where would you put Dick Cheney on this on the uh, families, corrupt families? Would you put him anywhere on the list or no? Only reason I ask is because the movie that came out a couple of years ago, Vice, uh, played by uh, Christian Bale, and, and how they sold him being the real master decision maker behind closed doors, with George W. just being a nice guy that was you know trying to do his best to be a president. Where would you put Cheney on that list? Well, there's always been a question about Cheney uh, and his, um, you know, his corporate ties and his work uh, in the private sector uh, from when he was sec deaf in the Bush administration and when he became vice president of the United States. Um, he had certainly a lot of stock options that were coming as a result of that. Um, so um, there certainly are issues of conflicts of interest that need to be raised there. Um, I don't know uh, if those decisions influenced um, were influenced by those. But it's certainly something that needs to be investigated and explored. I haven't looked at it. I'm looking at current uh, elected officials as it comes out. But I would welcome it. I think there should be scrutiny of all of that. Um, transparency is a good thing. The American people, I believe, are forgiving people. And what do I mean by that? They recognize that political leaders need to make a living. They recognize that people go in and out of government and in and out of the private sector. They're, they're sophisticated enough to know that. 
They also know when people are enriching based on their government office. So I would say that that needs to be investigated um, uh, uh, thoroughly. Fair enough. I got a couple more topics before we wrap up here. You know, we've talked about a lot of different people, politicians, billionaires. Uh, we've talked about media. We've talked about, you know, lobbyists. We talk about a lot of different people. Who would you say in order are the most powerful people in America? The actual politicians, the billionaires, the media folks, the lobbyists, or others? Uh, I'd say the most powerful right now are the titans of Silicon Valley. Uh, because of the stranglehold that they have on information. Uh, and we've seen, uh, uh, you know, some evidence of that with Twitter banning the New York Post, but it goes far, far, far deeper than that. Uh, you know, the vast majority of people, some estimate 80%, are getting their news and their information uh, basically from platforms like Facebook and Twitter, uh, that, that they're relying on Google for their search algorithms. Um, and, and they have a, a, an ability to manipulate news and information, and they use it. Uh, and that, to me, is extremely troubling because they essentially walk in lockstep. They all have generally the same worldview, uh, and they can use that power in such a way as to influence the politicians and who gets elected. So I would put Silicon Valley Titans first, not just because of their wealth, but because of their ability to control information. Um, I would put second among that uh, public uh, uh, government officials, meaning President of the United States and members of Congress. Um, what you often see is, you know, whether it's uh, people in Wall Street, people in, in oil companies who are rich, who are successful, going to Washington, D.C. with their tail between the legs, and oftentimes they should, but that's a demonstration of the power and the authority that government has. Think about it this way. Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, enormously wealthy, uh, enormously successful. Does he have more power than the number two person at the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA? I would argue he does not. Think about it this way. Bill Gates made his money by selling computers, voluntary exchange. People give money to, to Microsoft. Microsoft sends you the product that you're buying. That's how he made his money. Now he's got money. He can fund political campaigns. He can fund charitable activities. But Bill Gates cannot really legally compel anybody to do anything. If Bill Gates came to me and said, you know, I think your lawn looks bad. I want you to change your lawn. I can tell Bill Gates to get lost. The number two in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency has a lot of power vested in his authority. Uh, he can, he can, put in process a procedure to confiscate land from individuals. He can bring criminal charges against uh, individuals that he feels have violated um, the environment. And he may or may not be right. But the point is, who has actually the power to compel people to do something? I would say they had the number two person at the EPA has more power than Bill Gates does. So I government officials second. Um, and then I would probably... Uh, list um, third, um, uh, the media. Uh, and what I mean by that is sort of the mainstream media, their ability to uh, uh, influence and determine what stories and what narratives that they feel are important. And, and where do billionaires rank on here? Nowhere do I, would put, I would put billionaires below that because I would say that I don't view billionaires as a monolith. Um, there are certainly ones that are very engaged in wanting to sort of transform uh, uh, American society. I mean, George Soros, for example, uh, very, very active in a number of initiatives. He wants to reshape things in the United States and other parts of the world in the way that he wants them to. And, and he can do that. He's rich and he runs these charities. You can look at somebody on the right side of the spectrum who's more libertarian. You, look at, you can look at the Koch brothers and say that they're doing the same thing. So there's no question that they have power and that they have influence, but I think they're less monolithic than the media. They're less monolithic than Silicon Valley. Um, and they certainly uh, can make a huge difference, uh, but I think it's much more constrained and limited. And by the way, let me just add, one of the reasons that has changed, again, I would return to uh, the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump in 2016 shattered what was considered an iron rule of politics for decades, which was the guy who raises the most money 
the guy who gets the most big money donors from Wall Street and everywhere else is, is elected president of the United States. Donald Trump did not do that in 2016. He broke that rule. And I think it's a great thing that he did. And I think it's one of the reasons that billionaires don't have the power that they did maybe eight or 10 years ago. Where would you put universities on there? Would universities be below billionaires and media and government officials? Well, if you think long-term, in terms of long-term power, uh, you probably have to put them up at number one or number two. Uh, because again, their ability to shape uh, the view sure. and attitudes of people. Um, and and it, it, it really, to me, is stunning, uh, the, the fact that the uh, First Amendment, that freedom of thought, is being diminished at our universities is, is outrageous. It also speaks to me, though, to this. It speaks to me the complete lack of confidence that the hard left in this country actually has. Because if the hard left believed that their ideas were attractive, that their ideas were seductive, that their ideas were superior to those being presented by conservatives or moderates, they would want an open discussion. They would want to expose the weakness, uh, the, the fallibility, the ridiculousness of conservative ideas. But they don't do that because they recognize that their ideas really are not that attractive. The only way that they can get the adoption of their ideas is by creating an environment where other ideas are excluded. So that gives them enormous power, but they're also, in my mind, a paper tiger. Uh, and when you get a competition of ideas, they are generally going to lose. Powerful. So number one, it could be a 1A, 1B, Titans of yeah. Silicon Valley University. So the university is more long-term social media right now. Number two or number three would be government, government officials President, Congress, Senate next, or would you say President, Congress, Governor? How would you, how would you put yeah, that? I would, say, I would say President, Congress. So much of the power now is in Washington D.C. Okay. It shouldn't be, but it is. It is what it is. Then we have media, mainstream media. Then it's billionaires. Billionaires don't have as much influence as they used to have, which is actually very good news to see that taking place. Um, this this next topic we'll go into. It's either going to be a thirty second topic or it could be a five minute topic. Voter fraud. It's a topic that's coming up right now. Obviously, as you and I are talking about this, President Trump is probably tweeting saying, we're going to win. We got this. They did this. They did voter fraud. And you got the other side of saying, listen, just concede already. Give it up already. You know, let's move on already. And then you're saying constitutional attorney saying, look, he's not going to concede. He's going to drag this out. And if he gets into a Supreme Court and he won Kavanaugh and he won, you know, Amy Coney Barrett, what most people don't realize is back in 2000 when George Bush and Gore were going through it. Both Kavanaugh and Coney Baird were a part of that when they took place, and it flipped. Obviously, we know who became president for 30 days. Al Gore was a president-elect. How much value are you putting behind what Giuliani, what a lot of these guys are doing right now in Trump's camp with voter fraud? Well, I think voter fraud is a huge problem. Uh, we've actually done research on that at the Government Accountability Institute. It's a huge problem. The reason it's a huge problem is not only because it happens and it's increasingly happening, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to detect. And this is the problem. So, you know, inevitably, there are going to be lots of examples that are brought forward of dead people voting, of people saying that a ballot was cast in their name when they didn't vote, or somebody that was denied to vote because it was said that they had already voted. You're gonna find lots of examples of that. The challenge and the problem is showing critical mass in the size and the scope of how much voter fraud has happened. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. I think absolutely uh, it's good and it's healthy uh, for President Trump to go through this process. Uh, he has every right to. Um, and look, Washington, D.C. And, and our system of government is a, is a government of institutions. We have courts. We have laws. We have a process that can be followed. And claims of voter fraud and going through judicial review are part of that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And I think he should be doing that. The question will come down, I think, ultimately to the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Supreme Court. I, I, I fear uh, that uh, Chief Justice Roberts and others are going to be loath to be sort of thrust into the middle of this for fear of, of the damage in their mind that it might do to the Supreme Court. Uh, my view is this is precisely the sort of the thing that the Supreme Court should evaluate and should look into, assuming that these 
uh, suits that have been introduced have claims, there's merit to them, which I think there probably is. Um, so I think the process should go for it, but a lot of people that sort of are, are embracing the notion of the sky is falling, what are we going to do? We went through this in 2000, we're gonna go through this now. It's not gonna be a process that a large portion of people are gonna be happy with at the end of the day, but this is the nature of the American system. And those that are saying he shouldn't do this, this is un-American, this is wrong, uh, I think they're being ridiculous and, and have a very short memory, uh, particularly when after 2016, so many people uh, like Hillary Clinton and others were saying that he was not the legitimate president. I think if Joe Biden survives these court challenges and the votes stay in place, Joe Biden is the president of the United States, but Donald Trump has certainly a legitimate reason to challenge some of the voting in some of these states through the judicial process. Fair enough. I think it's fair to say that Joe Biden and uh... Trump are very different types of presidents and candidates. So let's assume he goes through inauguration, Trump concedes, it's done, Joe Biden's the president, 46, it's official, everybody knows about it. What does a Biden administration look like the next two to four years? Uh, I think it's going to be a administration that on foreign policy will be center left. Uh, and then when it comes to Secretary of Labor, Labor Policy, Treasury Department, uh, will be much more progressive into the left, to the hard left. And they will try to use um, their executive authority um, to um, advance their agenda. Um, I do think that the Republicans will hold the Senate um, and that they will successfully block a lot of the more radical initiatives that are being pushed. I think also in the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi has certainly had her wings clipped. Uh, her majority has shrunk. Uh, and a lot of people that are in swing districts uh, that are Democrats are not going to want to follow uh, a lot of the more radical agenda. But let me, you know, let's be clear, there's a lot of damage that can be done by a Bernie Sanders as a Secretary of Labor, by Elizabeth Warren as uh, Secretary of the Treasury. There's a lot that can be done to, uh, to damage the energy industry uh, through regulation. Um, so uh, the damage will be done, but it will be obviously more limited uh, because of the restrictions imposed by a Republican Senate. So it's going to be bad, but not as bad because they have to win Senate for that to take place, which is leading us to Georgia, knowing the fact that those two seats, this will be the last topic we'll cover and we'll wrap up. They're saying $200 million is going to put into uh, uh, this runoff that's going to take place in Georgia. Wh where are you at with how this is going to take place and how it's going to end up and how ugly it could potentially get in Georgia? Well, and my hope is, and this is where my optimist uh, comes in, my hope is because so much is riding on this election, it's one state in this Georgia that a lot of the funny business that we've seen in a lot of other states about backdating uh, ballots, about signing as a witness when a witness was required, that a lot of that will be a lot harder to pull off in a systematic way, given the focus in Georgia. Now, that's incumbent upon the Republican Party uh, and, and journalists to look at this stuff seriously and to follow it. Uh, I think it'll be a fair process. I think at the end of the day, um, and I'm not terribly great at predictions, so there's not a lot of value in this. I think at the end of the day, uh, the Republicans will probably carry these seats uh, because I think Georgia remains a, a, a center-right state. I think in the presidential race, you have questions about certain ballots. I also think you saw in suburban Atlanta uh, a lot of people who are, let's say, center right, um, who for personal reasons, uh, because of his manners, because of his tweetings, would not vote for Donald Trump, but I do think will turn around and vote for Republican Senate. So you think it's essentially going to end up being 52 to 48 when the whole thing is over with? Yes, that's that's my prediction. On terrible predictions, I will go on the record and say in <laughs> that Romney was going to win, and in 2016, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. So I'm not a great man for predictions, but that's what I think is going to happen in Georgia. Well, first of all, you're a class act. I've really enjoyed talking to you the last, you know, 80 minutes or so, 90 minutes or so. Thank you for your insight. Folks, if you're watching this, uh, we're going to put the link below to all three of his books with the one at the top being Profiles in Corruption for you to be able to order for yourself. I suggest you order all three of them. We'll, again, put the link below. Uh, uh, on the three books that he has. And with that being said, Peter, thank you so much for being a guest on Value Tainment. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So what do you think about what uh, Peter Schweitzer said? Do you think there's a lot of corruption in politics in America? Yes, no, maybe. And if yes, who, how, 
and what can be done about it. Comment below. And if you enjoyed this interview, I have another interview to watch that's similar to this from uh, the author of Economic Hitman. His story, if you've never heard his story, probably one of the most unique stories of what John Perkins did. Click over here to watch that interview. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.